On September 13th, 2016, there was a flash flood that no one in our lifetime has ever seen before. It took out trees and boulders, it washed away people's back holes, it washed out the bridge at our house. It was just a lot of water, a lot of pressure coming down and it widened the river two to three times, sometimes four times as wide in some areas of the river. And what happened here at this spot is that the river used to flow on the north bank. But after the flood, it migrated all the way over to where we're standing now, to the south bank. On the north bank, Wailuku Water Company has their diversion and they were, up until the 13th, collecting 100% of the stream water into the diversion to sell it off. After the flood, no water was going into the diversion. So they got access and a permit to deal with their property, which is the actual grate and the diversion. But it was pointless and useless to them if no water was going into it. On October 6, my friends and I, um, Lani and Mikiala, we decided to go up to Iao that morning. And when we woke up, we just felt that the valley was calling us. So we went. And when we got up there, we were just like, whoa, it's like the wild, wild west up here. All these machines lined up up and down the river. And at Kipaniwai alone, there was four machines. I was one of the three girls that um, came up on October 6th and witnessed Wailuku Water Company redirecting Wailuku River back to their main intake. Wailuku Water Company, in this excavator here, an employee is currently redirecting the river that was flowing here to the right, back to the left where their diversions are. And we just got the excavator to stop right now, and his bosses ran away. So we're waiting to talk to somebody, and until then, we're gonna stand right here. Although it was illegal and not within the scope of their permits, they had a large excavator in here moving uh, the stream completely over so that the water would flow 100% back into the diversion, and they were successful in that. You can see that big pile of debris there, the rocks and sediment. They had moved everything over this way so that the water would be rerouted back into their diversion. It just really hit me hard because I was seeing big, huge boulders coming out by the tons being loaded into trucks every 15 minutes. And there was this moment when I was standing looking into the river by the bridge and it, it hit me. And I got this eha feeling, this sadness that what was happening in the river was not pono. You know, Pohaku to us isn't just rocks, it is our kupuna. And Pohaku has witnessed generations of events in the river. Kipaniwai, just the stories, like the damming of the bodies during the Kipaniwai battle. And a lot of lives were lost. A lot of our kupuna, from Hana to Kahakuloa, were lost in that valley. Everyone, if you have a lineal connection to Maui, all have ties to the sacred valley. And so when I was looking down in the river and seeing tons of, of earthen material leaving the river, I, I felt sadness. I felt at that moment that my kupuna was talking to me. We know a lot of the pohaku that they've taken have already been crushed into gravel, and that hurts. But what they did take out, and that is being stored in Waikupu, we're demanding that they return it, because that is where they belong. Wailuku, of course, comes from the meaning Wai, which of course means water, yeah, that which provides life, the essence of life. And Luku, which has a meaning, of course, which means destruction or to destroy. And it really has to do with 
and really tells you how much water can come down this particular valley. And it has a long history of one where, as part of Navai Eha, the four waters of Waikapu, Wailuku, Waiehu, and Waihe'e, Navai Eha was said to be the most farmed land, taro cultivation in all of the islands. And therefore, you would have the ability to really feed many, many thousands of people who are residing on Maui. You know, unfortunately, today, most of these waters have been diverted and has affected the amount of taro. You know, it's very limited that grows in this area. That's kind of a sad thing to kind of realize, in fact, that the amount of productivity that this land's actually had to provide food for our peoples, you know, today really is one that, you know, um, barely trickles down into the ocean. And so Wailuku itself starts at the very back of the valley, of course, and flows all the way into the Pakukalo area in, in Wailuku, Waihu. When you look at that, that whole valley of itself, there are many of our stories within that valley of it being a very important place, highly, highly spiritual place. All the ancient and traditional ali'i and uh, the rulers from not just Maui, not just Oahu, but and truly from all the islands, the most highest ranking ali'i, their ivi, which is also highly kapu, very sacred, would be taken and protected and, and, and secreted in our, our burial vaults up in the mountains here. It's our version of the Valley of the Kings where many of our greats, ali'i, are deposited. And so the manna of their past are still being held in Iao. The blatant disrespect to our people from our own mayor, Mayor Arakawa, is a prime example of what we're dealing with on Maui. And on October 20th, he went on the radio show and did an interview with Jack Gist and he said, this made up religion, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to have a toothbrush and go through every rock that washes down the river with it? Is everything sacred? These comments alone just goes to show the type of government we had and the type of disrespect towards our host culture that we continue to deal with. Over and above all the concerns that a lot of residents have about the behavior of the county along and in Wailuka River, there's also some pretty big questions about how the tax dollars are being spent and if they're being spent appropriately. Two big questions surrounding debris removal and the contract bidding process need to be answered by the county. We know that a lot of the funding was being given with the assumption that FEMA funds were going to repay a lot of the funds that were spent by the county, except that FEMA rules are pretty clear about what is reimbursable and what is not reimbursable. The only debris removal that is eligible for reimbursement is debris that is directly related to the storm. Debris removal from private property is not eligible. It's really important to note that all the land in the riverbed from the bridge up is Wailuku Water Company land, that's private land. And a large amount of the work being done by the county was on that land, hauling material that was not debris. It was pre-existing pohaku, it was soil, it was sediment from the riverbed. So the material being hauled out by the county was the actual riverbed itself on private land. So that tells us that none of that activity is reimbursable by FEMA funding. The next big concern is about the bidding process itself and who got paid these contracts to do the work. FEMA rules say contracts must be competitively bid to successfully receive public assistance grant funding. On the floor of the special council meeting talking about this funding, Councilmember Cochran asked about the bidding process to the department heads and they said that it wasn't necessary because of the emergency proclamation. So either they didn't understand the FEMA rules or they were being dishonest about the bidding process. We're taking on that kuleana to Malama Iao and we are demanding that the county and the state put back the pohaku that they took out. They took 100% of the water back to their intakes. So what we're trying to do is just make a stand and say, why, you know, why can't you share it? Mother Nature obviously spoke and, you know, the river changed its course. So what we're doing is just up here, going by hand and trying to just restore flow. We're not trying to take all the water. We're trying to keep the connectivity. They have water going to their intake. We have water going back Malka to Makai, full connectivity. You know, the other thing too is with their intake, the cement intake with grates. You know, just being mindful of our native aquatic species, such as the O'opu, it's very troublesome for them to get up Malka when they're spawning. So what we're trying to do is just keep the river in its natural state as best as possible, and we're just kind of moving pohakus. 
to allow the river to flow and get that connectivity that it so desperately needs. You know, as a Native Hawaiian, we have a right to be in the river. The parks are all closed since the storm. We're practicing our cultural right to be in here, protecting our natural resource, protecting the water, protecting the pohakus, and protecting all the native aquatic species. You can see there's keiki. Now all community members here are Native Hawaiians, farmers, professors, students, a little bit of everyone just in here giving a little bit of input and work that they can contribute. We're just working with Aloha and bringing our community together to protect what's so important for us and future generations to come. It's not just about what's happening up in the valley. This all matters. The entire river going back down to Pakukalu, you know, Malka to Makai. So when you look at Kepani Wai today, it's a place of high honor. It's a place of high culture and, and great traditions. And we should do whatever we can to endeavor to not just protect the sanctity of that place, but educate uh, the rest of our island and community and how important Kepani Wai and Iao is for our people. So not just looking at something in the past, but really talking about how we should look at Iao into the future. There needs to be more real Hawaiian cultural representation in all parts of our government. We've lost too many sacred spaces and the time is now. What's happening in Iao is an awakening for a lot of our young generation. The valley is calling us. Mm -hmm.